Hello, everyone. I'm pleased to be here with my friend Paul. My name is Rodrigo de Oliveira. I'm the Great Kotlin DSL project lead. I consider myself a code gardener, and in a past life, I played the drums. I recommend you to check out the guitar player is sick. Hey, everyone. So I'm Paul Merlin, um, principal engineer at Redlink, and writer of software for many years. Dry stone builder on my free time and wine lover, as some of you already know. So, what about you? How many of you have used Kotlin? Cool. And how many of you um, have a good grasp of the Gradle Groovy DSL? Cool. Cool. What about the Kotlin DSL? Ah, interesting. Cool. So I hope you like that. So first things first, um, everything we're going to show you works today in IntelliJ IDEA and is planned to work in Eclipse 2 thanks to the Eclipse BuildShip plugin. Yeah. So pleasant authoring experience, right? Just what do we mean? Do we mean like setting up your office in a very nice way so you can just code, right? No, actually we mean two things, very, two very specific things, right? The first one is quickness. Quickness is about being effective with minimal effort. That's what we mean here, right? It's having the minimal effort and achieving the maximum result, right? That entails things like having quick feedback, staying in a state of flow. So when you're authoring build scripts, you want the IDE to be helping you every step of the way. You want the IDE to make good suggestions. You want the IDE to make sure your code makes sense. In a language like Kotlin, that means statically checking your code for errors, right? You want to have quick access to documentation, right? A big part of writing build scripts is integrating these different pieces of functionality Right, distributed as plugins, so we have to make sense of those pl plugins. We have to understand what the configuration options mean and all that. Another important aspect, right, it's then if it gets to that, you should be able to go and just access the source code, right? Some plugins might not have uh, enough documentation or you're just wondering how something is implemented, right? So let's just see how we fare in this regard. So this is a typical... Let me make it a bit bigger. Can you all read on, on the back? Is, is it okay? Bigger? What's the short code, uh, shortcut to make font bigger? Is there like... No, you can maybe... I don't know. No. It works for me. <laughs> Like that? Yeah, that works. Good? Okay, cool. thank you. No. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So, the, f the first aspect, right? is having the IDE helping you every step of the way, right? Giving you suggestions and all that. Suggestions, for instance, of what sort of plugins, right, can I apply? Maybe I'm writing, I want to write a play application. I want to know which plugins are available there, right? And if you want, I want to know more about the plugins that are available, I should have access to the documentation, right? And Maybe I want to understand a build script that I just, you know, have handed to me. So I want to know, whoa, what this application plugin does. So maybe I want to go to the plugin user guide, right, and see, learn more about that plugin. Right? Things like making sure my code makes sense, as I said, type checking. So if I do something like 
this, right? Which doesn't make sense because source compatibility actually expects a Java version, right? So the ID is telling me that this doesn't make sense. That sort of thing. And it's important that all of these features, they work right across the board. So I can trust that when I need documentation on any aspect right, of my build script, I can have this sort of documentation. So what's this application block here? Oh, it's a configuration of the application project convention. Right? And if it gets to that, right, I can go and then see, oh, how, how this piece of functionality is actually implemented, right? So another aspect of pleasant tutoring is low cognitive overhead. Like, how many things you have to keep in mind to know uh, the context where you're working on. Um, you need to be able to offload all this from your head and let the IDE helps you um, know this context and have confidence in the IDE that it will have everything it needs to help you. Um, basically find the information you need when you need it, not having to know the whole context ahead. And this entails to feeling always in control and never being helpless. And that's particularly important when you're working with a model such as Grail, which is dynamic, where the, the, the model gets contribution from plugins you apply. So it depends on what was applied. What's available depends on what was applied. And you must be confident that the ID can know that and provide, like guides you and helps you in this regard. Yeah. So, what is cool? so let's just take a pause here and look at this build script. Uh, is the font is more again, right? The font is more again. So if I execute this task, right, so here we have a build script. I'm declaring a single task. I do that by opening the tasks block and declaring my task, right? And as part of the task execution, I'm going to print the group, right? And what is the group? So anyone uh, want to make a guess what this task will print to the console? My group? My group? I've heard my group somewhere. <laughs> so uh, we, could, we could just see, right? Wow. It's no. Why that is, right? So at that point, you could be you know, going over your head, trying to figure out and trying to keep all this. Oh my god, I have this group here. So what's going on there, right? But you can also just ask the IDE. The IDE is there to help you. So what's this group, right? I could, for instance, I could check the type. It's a string, so yeah, that's what I thought it would be. But just which string, right? So actually, we are inside a task. And it so happens that task has a group property so when I thought my build script was actually accessing the group property of the project because my code is in this nested context, right, where I have all these properties available from the enclosing context, right, the group was actually the task group and not the project group, as I, as I thought. So at that point, right, I can go back and fix my code to actually refer explicitly to the task group, right? And then if I execute the task again, I now have my group, right? 
and that was easy. I never had to feel helpless because the idea was there to tell me at every step of the way. Right? Another aspect right, that uh, Paul mentioned is the this discoverability of this dynamic model. Every plugin will augment, will make contributions to the Gradle project model, right? We will add tasks, we will add project configurations, right? We will add extensions that let you lets you configure right how plugins behave. So if I want to configure my application, right? Well, I can't configure an application. Oh, that's why. There's no application extension in my model yet, right? So by applying the right plugin, and then trying one more time, and saving the build script, <laughs> so IDEA has a chance to synchronize with the, with the Gradle model, I now get the extension, right? So I can configure my class at that point, right? And if for any reason, right, this dynamic model changes underneath me because maybe after editing the build script, right, I remove this plugin for any reason or I changed the plugin I was using, right? I want to have immediate feedback that something is no longer right with my build script and it goes red, right? So I can go back and put my application back and it's all good again. So that's, that's part of the, the experience, right? To have low cognitive overhead. Cool. So another aspect of pleasant tutoring is how you can organize build logic. Because for now, we only seen very, very simple example. But in reality, the, the build logic gets complex and over time it can evolve, get more and more complex, and, and so on. And we need tools to manage this complexity. Basically, we will see how uh, the Kotlin DSL provides tools to manage this complexity uh, by taking the most advantage of the IDE. And of course, with as less ceremony as possible. So. What's the, let's say, like the simplest or the, the most fundamental unit of logic, right? We might want to share between build scripts or just, I might want just to move some piece of logic somewhere else so I can organize my, my code better. Right? That would be probably a function, right? So in, in this case here, so yeah. here we are looking at, at a sample and specifically, we're looking at a sample that has a build source project. So a build source project is a special project that is recognized by Gradle by default, right? And Gradle will build this project and put the resulting jar into the build class path. So it becomes available to every build script, right? So if I want to share a function with other build scripts, or I just want to move my function to my build source so I can organize my code better, the only thing, or the only things I need to do should be creating a source file in the right location, like source, main, Kotlin, right? And make sure my build Gradle KTS enables the support for the Kotlin DSL. And that's it. That's very low ceremony indeed. So to share a function, it's really just defining the function, right? In this case, we have a very simple function indeed, and that's it. That's my whole file, and in my build Gradle, now in my project file, in my root project, I see that I can just use it, right? And in fact, I can go to sources, I can look up documentation, all the things, right, that you would normally expect to do. But a function is 
as I said, that just this minimal like unit of reuse, right? So Gradle includes concepts such as tasks and plugins, right? So I should be able to share tasks, to share plugins. And the mechanism is effectively the same. A task is just a class that inherits from one of the built-in task uh, supertypes. In this case, I'm using default task. And I can just, again, use that task. And I'm doing that even by using an abstraction on top of the task. I'm using a function that will declare the task. And the function can do that because it can use this Kotlin mechanism called extension members, right? Extension functions. So this with hello task extends the project, right? And since my build script is actually running in the context of a project, when I call that function, that function will be operating on that project. So this will declare my task. And again, everything should just work as expected, right? You can have access to documentation. You can get more documentation from there. You can navigate to sources, as you saw. Right. The next thing I want to share or organize in, in my build logic is this plugin, right? A plugin might you know, contribute several tasks, extensions, and all that, but the mechanism stays the same, right? Here I have a plugin that contributes a task, right? And notice a very important thing here. Because I'm using this uh, Kotlin built-in function run that executes a block of code, like a Lambda expression, in the context, in the context of the object I just invoked it with, and this is the project, I basically can use all the same goodness that is available to build scripts inside. I can create a, I can just open a tasks block and declare tasks, right? So it becomes very easy to organize build logic because you can basically just move code around as you see fit. So you can just get your whole task, your whole plugin from your build script into build source, and that's it. And then you can refactor from there. You can do however you want. And it's important that we recognize, right, that even though everything we just shown you, shown you here is available today, and it's working, and we don't think we're there yet. We're not there yet. That there's more that we, we, we have to provide so we can really, you know, call this uh, Kotlin DSL project a 1.0 version, you know, that it gets proper uh, Gradle support, official support, right? Sure. And one of the things we want to ensure is that the users never gets blocked in the IDE. Like, it, it can happen in some situation, especially with the class pass resolution, which is pretty heavyweight. And yeah, basically, we, we'll make sure the UI do not block, because it can happen in, under certain circumstances now. And yeah. Yeah, you can think of things like build logic oriented refactorings. So basically the steps I've just mentioned in the previous demo, for instance, extract function to build source, extract plugin to build source, extract task, right? So this having the IDEs recognizing these units of logic that are very specific to, to the Gradle model, right? Yeah, and still in IDEs, uh, the suggestions list can be a bit overwhelming for now. Because when you ask for code suggestions uh, inside a nested block, for example, you get everything that's available at the outer context, 
including what's available in the inner context. And you have to look it up. So we, we envisioned something and we, we made some prototypes already to have a first step of suggestions that only suggest you what's available in the inner scope. So you have like very little choices. And then you can see what's available in the wider scope progressively. Yeah. While that's not uh, a reality, uh, right? We can make do by using this simple trick, right? Things like making sure you just specify the context more narrow, like you narrow the context of your query. So now with, by typing this dot, I only see what's available in the innermost context, right? And actually, uh, Kotlin has this feature that lets you actually address the specific context you want to see, right? So I can actually see, oh, in the tasks context, right? What's available there, right? And in the do less context only, what's available there, and so on. Right? And some other things that we're going to talk about later on during this presentation. So let's take a look at the challenges we have ahead of us as we approach the 1.0 release. Yeah, and we have quite a few. So, yeah. Um, all this goodness um, is available today in IntelliJ, and we are working closely with JetBrains for this. And, but as we may know, Gradle also owns uh, Eclipse build chip integration. And so we plan to, of course, make it on par. And part of this is about us providing um, public APIs for tooling clients like IDEs allows them to provide all this goodness to their users. And yeah, we also want to provide the ability to write the settings file in Kotlin. It's not possible today. But yeah, and this entails basically, again, public API for tooling providers because they often rely on the settings file to detect build layouts and so on. And of course, being able to write init scripts in Kotlin too. And here the challenge is most, mostly about class pass issues. Yeah, and as, as you saw, um, the Gradle built-in plugins are very easily discoverable from the IDE. Inside the plugins block, you, you just start to type the name of a plugin and you get the list. And we would like to get the, the plugins, all the community plugins, like we have thousand, thousands now. Uh, to be discoverable from directly from the IDE, yeah, and it, in a type safe way. Uh, speaking of the community plugins, many of them have been written with only Groovy in mind, and so uh, we need to have some better bridging functionality to allow builds to use these plugins without too much hurdle. Yeah, and specifically on the topic. Uh, Nadav, Cohen, and I will have a talk, the next talk, uh, specifically talking about Groovy and Kotlin, right? So if you want to know more about some techniques for Groovy interop, please join us later. Yeah, and one, one last challenge we want to tackle is to move away from the build script block. And to understand why it's important that we move away from the build script, script block as the main mechanism for, for making changes to the build script class path, right? It's important that we understand first how these all work, right? This integration between Gradle, the Kotlin DSL, the IDEs, how they collaborate, right, to provide this experience. So let's look first at the usual scenario of using Gradle, running a Gradle build from the command line, right? So the user asks Gradle, to run the build task. And during the initialization phase, Gradle has to discover the layout of the build. So Gradle finds out that, oh, this build is actually using a build Gradle KTS file. So Gradle will then, uh, when I say Gradle, I mean Gradle core, right? The core parts of Gradle, because the Kotlin DSL is decoupled, the DSL part sits on top of Gradle, right? And Gradle 
will say, oh, I need to apply this build cradle K KTS. So the Kotlin DSL at that point has to analyze the build script and it actually goes through a few steps before it can actually execute your build script. The first step is to extract the build script block from the build script, compile it and execute it. So the build script block is executed on its own first and all the contributions to the class path are computed at that point from the build script block. After that, the Kotlin DSL will extract the plugins block. We'll evaluate the plugins block against the project and this will apply all the plugins and the plug plugins will have a chance then to make their contributions to the model, right? Plugins will then create tasks, create new configurations. They will add extensions to, to the model. So at that point, the Kotlin DSL can then reflect on the project and see all these extensions, tasks, configurations there. And with that information, the Kotlin DSL assembles in runtime a special jar, right? It emits Kotlin code, assembles this special jar with all the static accessors, right? These things we're calling accessors, these project extensions that let you use things like the application extension very easily, that kind of thing. And then after that, you can actually compile the script body, like the whole file with this combined class path from all these phases and then execute it against the project and the build continues, right? So uh, and with this model in mind, it, it, we can now understand why it's, it is not possible, for instance, to declare a variable at the very top of the file and expect to use that variable across every single block. Because in fact, it's like you have three scripts interleaved in one because of this execution model. And again, the reason we, we need this execution model is so we can provide the goodness by generating this code and all the accessors. Yeah, and the, the fact that the file is, is kind of split into the build script, the plugins block, and the body of the script, is, it's the same with the Groovy DSL. Yeah. What's also implied here, right, and I just wanted to make that clear, is that any contributions that happen after the plugins block have been, has been executed are not available, you know, for ID completion and all that, because they are simply not there when the Kotlin DSL introspects the project, right? Yeah. Plugins can register logic to execute at any point in time. So only the logic that executed up to the plugins block is taken into account. Yeah, and one important thing to understand is that in the build script block, you, you declare dependencies to plugins, but the build script block itself do not apply them to the project. And that's a major difference with the plugins block, which actually applies, like declares the dependency, fetch it, and apply it. Yeah. And that's thanks to this that we can do all this goodness. So the next scenario, right, is when you are authoring a build script inside an ID like IntelliJ, right? So what happens in that case is that the user, when the user opens a file, a build Gradle KTS file, right, the IDE will ask the Kotlin DSL. There's this particular component that we're calling the Kotlin DSL client that runs together with the IDE, be it like IntelliJ or Eclipse, whatever IDE. And this, this piece of of, of uh, functionality provides the service of resolving the class path so the IDE can actually provide all the goodness. And the way it works is that we basically emit a query over a tooling API connection to the actual grade, Gradle build. And uh, that's the piece we're calling the Kotlin DSL server there. That's the, gra the Gradle build running with the Kotlin DSL and Gradle core, right? And so all the steps from the previous uh, scenario is still apply because you, you have to go through the build script block, the plugins block, ex execute the body, have the accessors, and then you can build this model and give it back to the IDE. And so when the IDE receives the class path model, it, it can then highlight the, the build script properly, it can, provide, it can provide all sorts of services, right? And 
the, the challenge that we mentioned before, right, has to do with how long it takes for this whole process to happen. We have this communication go going on. Dependency resolution will be triggered. Let's say you just add a new plugin to your plugins block, right? And this plugin will be downloaded for the first time from the portal, right? We want to make sure you don't have to wait for all those processes to, ha to happen before you can edit your file. So what's next on the pipeline for us? Yeah, so we just talked about it. We want to deprecate WScript block in favor of the plugins block. It's very high on our list of priorities. And, and to do that, we need to make some steps to have more features baked into the plugins block. So first, we need to allow plugins to declare their API dependencies, just like with the Java library plugin, we make a difference between implementation and API dependency. And we need to, in the same vein, allow script plugins to declare their plugin dependencies. And to be able to apply script plugins from the plugins block. So that, that's already quite a lot. Yeah. And we also need to make all these community plugins coming from the portal available from corporate environment because the plugin portal, as you may know, is not mirrorable as a Maven repository. So we have to make some improvement there to allow people inside corporate environments to benefit from it. Yeah, and as a last step, we want to make the plugins block works across included builds in composite builds. So we can have more nice development experience when working on a plugin and uh, a sample project, or even uh, your corporate project and your corporate plugin that are in separate builds, but you want to work on both of them at the same time. Yeah, the, the other thing that is also high on our priority is to streamline even more how you can organize your build logic, right? So one uh, thing that we currently have to deal with, right, is that, uh, for instance, Kotlin classes are final by default, right? And for Gradle, we have to, to make them open. Open means they can be extended because Gradle wants to extend your tasks, your plugins. And Kotlin has plugins to make that happen by default, for instance. Right? We want to be able to share right, configuration code from external plugins. And a big part of that is the things that Paul already mentioned, right? making sure the plugins can declare API dependencies, they can declare plugin dependencies, and all that. And of course, a huge, hugely important aspect of any project, right, is documentation. And right now we don't have much documentation, so that's what we've been working on lately, and that's probably the bulk of our work, reaching 1.0. We made the Kotlin DSL API documentation available at this location already. This is a preview documentation, but it already covers all the API, all the extensions that are available to, to projects and everything. And it's, it's, um, it includes the whole Gradle API documentation plus what the Kotlin DSL contributes on top of it. So it's, it's quite useful already. Yeah. We also want to make sure that we have, for every sample in Groovy that we currently have in our user manual, right, we, have, we want to have the Kotlin equivalent, right? So we already have this hugely useful user manual, right? And currently, it's only about Groovy. We want to make it about Kotlin as well. Well, um, like Rodrigo said, we are approaching Wondodo. And we think it's the right time for you to provide feedback to us, because we are confident that the DSL and the ID integration are getting into shape. So it's, yeah, it's a good time for you to influence Wondodo. So we, yeah, basically it's a calling call for action, and you can find code at the location here. We welcome pull requests, new issues, any contribution. You can join and chat with us at the 
Gradle channel in the Kotlin Lang Slack. So, yeah. yeah. So that's what we had for you today. Any questions? A few. So um, I'm, I'm one of those people in the corporate world behind the firewall, can only use amazing proxy. How useful is it if I'm doing custom plugins at this point with the, with the limitations you just went over? Right, if, if you're writing your own custom plugins that you deploy to your, your own repository, that's okay, you can use it because uh, we have the plugin management DSL that you can use to configure custom repositories for your plugins, so that's okay. Yeah, and so, then you can use the plugins block. Yeah. Okay. That's covered. I had one there. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, what's that one? This one? Yeah. So what, what this plugin does is to configure the build source project to, um, mm. to provide um, the same um, compiler plugins we use in the in build scripts, in your Kotlin production code, in your build source project, so you can benefit from the same same DSL basically. Uh, there, there's a, there's another aspect to it is to make sure that your build source is running against the exact same version of the Kotlin standard library, the Kotlin compiler that is already shipped with Gradle. Right. So that's the so there's the library and the plugins. I had one there. Yeah. Do you mean the, uh, the build? Just yeah, the build. Yeah, no, so say you, you have built a closet for an enterprise product. Mm -hmm. uh, how crazy would it be to move your CI pipeline over to that? Just the whole thing. Yeah, so it really depends on how, like, the level of groovisms, if I can say that, in your build script. Like, Groovy is a very dynamic language. It has lots of like dynamic idioms that are very hard to capture in a language like Kotlin, right? Things like mat, you know, a meta class, you know, monkey patching, that kind of thing, right? And extending your groove object with arbitrary properties, that kind of thing. And that might lead to, to projects that are hard to then convert to a statically typed language. But if, you, if your uh, build scripts are like well behaved or well organized in that sense, in, in, in the sense that they just apply like configuration code, you have proper plugins, they're you know they're applied and configured, then it's it's a much easier transition and it's not crazy at all, right? And I, I, sh I should add, it's not crazy at all with Gradle 4.1. That's the first release we're actively looking for feedback because we, we believe it's it's getting into shape, right? Yeah, so it boils down just to supporting Gradle in CLIM, in fact. Well, and I'm talking about, I'm talking about supporting the minimum functionality yet. Yeah. Like yeah. Functionality. Uh, I, I think there is an open issue on the JetBrains tracker. Let's everybody vote for it, and it may happen. Yeah. It's not in our hands directly. I think I saw a hand here, no? Yeah, so we are running the latest snapshot distro from the Kotlin DSL repository. So basically, it's the same wrapper that are in the samples that we have in the Kotlin DSL repository. So this is running against a snapshot release of the Kotlin DSL. Yeah. So this snapshot release will be released as the 0.10 release, and that will be part of Gradle 4.1. So that's the, the plan. Any more questions? 
Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.